<laughs> okay. So the next presentation is, is classification of pelvic ring disruption. So what we're doing is we're piecing the jigsaw puzzle together. We've started with the first piece of the puzzle, and we know what is normal. And now what we're trying to do is move on to the next piece of the jigsaw puzzle and trying to identify what is abnormal and how we can put this into some sort of format that we can all understand, that we can all relate to someone else, um, and that we can hopefully use to help us with managing the patient and to give some sort of prognosis. And that's why we use classification systems for all the above mentioned uh, reasons. So there are various classification systems. Okay, and you're probably familiar with one or two of them, uh, the ones that you use on a day-to-day -day basis, but there are lots. There's a Lesnell classification, which is more of an anatomical-based classification system. There's a tile classification, which uh, uh, categorizes pelvic fractures into stable, uh, unstable, potentially unstable fractures. Um, and then there's the Young and Burgess classification, which, which uh, relates to the mechanism of the injury, there's the Dennis, uh, the Denis classification, looking at uh, sacral fractures um, and the anatomical location of these sacral fractures. And then there's the AO classification. So there's lots of classifications. And what we'll do is we'll try and run through some of these in, in some little more detail. And this, these, these classification systems, you'll bring out more in the discussion groups, etc. So the Lertonel classification, as I mentioned, is an anatomical classification system. And it divides the pelvis, the pelvic ring, into different anatomical sites, and it gives them a letter. So A would be that iliac wing fracture. B would be a fracture there, the posterior ilium going into the SI joint, and, and so on and so forth. So it gives each fracture uh, a letter, uh, which relates to the anatomical location on the bony pelvis. Uh, buckles uh, and tile um, looked at the classification relating to stability of the pelvis uh, and essentially divided it into rotational and vertical instability. Type A in tile classification are the stable fractures. Type B are the fractures which are rotationally unstable, so open up like that, but are vertically stable, so they stay where they are, they don't move up, they don't, the other side doesn't move up or down in relationship. To each other. And then, then the type C's are the ones that are horizontally unstable and vertically unstable as well, so they go up like that. Okay, and these are the very serious injuries that need um, immediate management from, from our point of view um, and then definitive management further. A lot of these patients with the type B's and the C's have associated injuries, and it's, it's important to appreciate all of these. So the type A's, what do the type A's include? Well, the type A's uh, can be subdivided into A1, A2, A3, and I'll put that up there for, for, for your benefit, but essentially the type A fractures are the stable fractures. It, they could be avulsion fractures, could be a stable iliac wing, wing fractures, or it could be transverse fractures of the, of the sacrum and the coccyx. It's important just to bear this one in mind, so a transverse fracture of the sacrum may be potentially unstable. It may have other fracture lines in other directions, so it may be a, a jumpers type fracture with an H shape or an I shape component to it. So it's really important in these, we have a transverse fracture, to get, a, to get a, a lateral sacral view or a true lateral or a CT scan to make sure that the sacrum hasn't done that and jumped forward. In case that can potentially be unstable. And here are some examples of the type A, so the stable type injuries. You have uh, an avulsion here of the anterior uh, superior iliac spine. You have an avulsion um, here of the anterior inferior iliac spine. You have an avulsion here of the initial tuberosity. <coughs> and when you put all these together, you find that um, the issue is probably the, uh, um, the largest site where you get these avulsion type fractures, and then the others are almost equally divided between ASIS and AIIS, and then very rarely we get other avulsion type injuries as well. Moving on to the type B, so again, remember these are the ones that are horizontally unstable, so they open up, but vertically they're pretty stable, okay? Well, they are stable. 
Um, B1s can be divided into uh, uh, 1, 2, and 3 again. And you can divide them up into 1, where the uh, synthesis diastasis is less than 2.5 centimeters. 2, where it's greater than 2.5 centimeters. Uh, and, and 3, in this particular case, where it's bilateral involvement of the pelvic ring. The B2s are the lateral compression uh, type injuries, which, which give uh, an internal rotation type uh, injury to one hemipelvis, um, or an external rotation type injury. And B2-1s are the ipsilateral injuries, B2-2s are the contralateral injuries with a bucket handle type. And this picture here, I'll show you on the next slide, shows you the bucket handle type injury where you've got an injury to one side of the pelvis at the back and the other side at the front, and this whole hemipelvis can move up like a bucket handle, up and down like so. The B3s are the bilateral posterior injuries, uh, and these are pretty unstable. This here just gives the uh, schematic uh, representation of the tile classification. The type Cs are the ones where we're moving onto a higher energy, higher severity, so we're moving to the other end of the spectrum, and these are rotationally unstable and vertically unstable as well. And we looked at our sectioning study um, in my first talk, and if you can imagine, the front's gone, the middle's gone, and the back's gone. Everything's gone, okay? And everything in between it has the potential to have been disrupted as well. So these are pretty serious injuries. Uh, and these, again, can be broken down into C1, C2, and C3. Uh, C1 is unilateral, C2 is bilateral, usually with one side which is a type B injury and one side which is a type C injury. And then the C3s which are bilateral type Cs. And then you move on to the Young and Burgess classification which is, which is the mechanistic classification. And uh, this is the one that I tend to use the most. Uh, I do sometimes use some of the others, but the one I use on a day-to-day -day basis is, is the Young and Burgess classification. And this gives me an idea of the mechanism of the injury. It allows me to predict some of the injuries that may well go with this injury pattern. And it also helps me to predict resuscitation needs as well. And these are divided into these four subgroups. So you have the anterior posterior compression, the lateral compression, and the vertical shear, the ones that go up, and then the combined mechanism. And we'll just talk through these in a little bit of detail. And this is helpful because in an acute setting, this helps us to correlate the injury pattern with blood loss, associated injuries, and mortality. So the anterior posterior compression type injuries, APCs, can be split up into one, two, and three. One is where you have Minimal diastasis, less than 2.5 centimeters. Two is whether you've got more than 2.5 centimeters diastasis. And three, where the whole front, middle, and back is gone, and you've got uh, a scenario where you've got a completely rotationally unstable pelvis. Um, and it may or may not be vertically unstable. So sometimes it may be difficult to tell between a, an ABC3 and a vertical shear type injury. Okay? But it's important to bear that in mind. The lateral compression, so the LC type injuries, can again be split up into three. So LC1, LC2, LC3. LC1 is usually an injury to, to the back of the pelvis, uh, so uh, to the ileum or to the sacrum, and then uh, a fracture through the, the front of the pelvis as well. So through uh, the rami, it may just be a, a superior ramus, it may be an inferior ramus, it may be both. Um, the LC2 fracture pattern um, is, is quite different and essentially, a, essentially a, an LC2 fracture is a fracture dislocation of the SI joint and we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail in, in, in the next couple of slides. So it's a fracture through the posterior ileum, usually here, and it goes into the SI joint and then part of the SI joint is, is dislocated and this needs to be put back and fixed. And then you have the LC3 type injuries which are the rollover type injuries. So if you, if you think, of, think of someone lying on the road and then uh, um, uh, a car uh, rolling over them, 
it's going to start rolling over my right side, so my right hemipelvis is going to internally rotate, and then the car wheel is going to keep continuing and it's going to externally rotate the left hemipelvis. So this is the windswept pelvis. Internal rotation deformity on one side and external rotation on the other side. And it's important to appreciate these. We'll talk about the crescent fracture um, just uh, in a little bit more detail. And as I mentioned, it's a, it's a fracture of the posterior ilium and it goes into the sacroiliac joint. And here we have a, an x-ray and a CT scan showing this. So there's the intact piece of the ilium. There's the intact piece of the ilium. There's a fracture going into the posterior ilium and into the SI joint. And you can see that there's a dislocation there. Okay. Well, just one other point. So why is it called a crescent fracture? Because that looks like a crescent. The intact bit is the crescent. Okay. And these can be classified into type 1, type 2, or type 3. Type 1 is where it's an anterior crescent, so it uh, ex exits at the anterior SI joint. Type 2 is where it comes in at the middle of the SI joint. And type 3 is where it's at the back of the SI joint. And this helps because it does help you into thinking of how you've managed these patients. If you've got a type 1 where it exits anteriorly, you, you may well consider doing a, a, an anterior approach, or you have the window 1 of the ileo inguinal, and consider anterior plating. Because most of the SI joint is intact, it's just the anterior part that isn't. If you've got a type 2, then you've got half of the sacroiliac joint which is, which is dis, uh, dislocated or subluxed, and this needs to be put back, and this is usually put back through the posterior approach, and you can use an intertable screw like that, or place some screws as well. And then the type three is where you've got a very little <coughs> present, very little posterior bone to fix, and it may be even smaller than that. So you imagine trying to get placing screws into that bit, there's gonna be a very poor purchase. So with these, it may be better to to reduce that dislocation and treat it as a dislocation and, and fix it with SI screws. And then we move on to the vertical shear. So these are the other end of the spectrum, as I said. Uh, this is still looking at uh, the Young and Burgess classification. So the vertical shear, and you can have uh, uh, one heavy pelvis, which is ridden up in comparison to the other, or you can get a vertical shear on both sides, and that is a very, very serious injury. Both hemi pelvi ridden up. And then in the Young and Burgess classification, or the adaptation of this, you've got um, a combined mechanism where you have a combination of injuries causing uh, a combination of other injuries, but also a, a combination of injuries to the bony pelvis. And it's important to realize that there's a 10% vascular risk with these. So I mentioned why I use this uh, classification, why I think it, um, it is helpful. And you can understand by looking at these figures here that the APC and the vertical shear fractures do bleed. Okay, they need massive transfusions. If you look at the mortality between the, the different fracture types, again, the APC threes, the APC twos, vertical shears, all of this group have a higher mortality. Okay, so we are able to predict transfusion requirements and, and possible mortalities, at least in sick patients. We move on then to the AO classification, and, and again, I've, I've put it there just in one slide, just for you to appreciate that there are other classifications. So the AO classification, again, looks um, very similar to the tile classification, that the stable fractures, rotationally unstable, or both rotationally and vertical, vertically unstable, and it categorizes fractures uh, into similar categories as, as the tile classification. So in summary, <coughs> We've talked, well the first two talks, I've talked, in the first talk, I talked about the anatomy, the normal anatomy, the normal radiological anatomy and the clinical anatomy of the intact pelvis. And then we pieced together the second piece of the jigsaw where we put together um, what's abnormal, so the abnormal anatomy or certainly the abnormal bony anatomy and we tried to group that into some sort of system that we can use to try and make sure we're all singing from the same sheet and talking the same language so we can describe things and we can identify patients who have certain types of injuries so we're grouping patients together now 
And then the next part of the jigsaw, where we want to lead this forward to, is the management. So we put together normal, put together abnormal, and our next piece of the jigsaw puzzle is to talk about treatment of these subgroups. And that's where we need to move on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Shaggy, for uh, these uh, two important lectures.